your Chargers linebacker, Dan Hanley, and you're tuning in with Chargers Unleashed. Welcome to another edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Jason Ballier here with you from the LA Football Network. If this is your first time tuning into the show, make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcast. Jason, who is filling in for Dan Wolkenstein, the part of Dan Wolkenstein today will be played by our very own uh, host of the Blueprints podcast, Jason Ballier. So even though it says Dan Wolkenstein on the banner, do not get make that make that mistake. Uh, Jason's coming in here. We are very excited to be live today. We are 11 days out from the NFL draft. Can't believe it's this close, Jason. I know that there is so much buzz going around right now. And if anything has taught us as far as what the buildup for the Chargers draft has been like over these past several months since Jim Harbaugh came into power of the Los Angeles Chargers, I can't wait to see what the next 11 days are going to have in store. Uh, But first and foremost, before we kick everything off, Jason, how are you, sir? Uh, Happy that you could join us again if you guys have not watched Jason's podcast which is basically another uh avenue from chargers unleashed his his podcast blueprints up there it's a great show um so very happy to have jason on here with us today jason how are you buddy man i'm doing good yeah 11 days isn't isn't that wild i feel like especially now too since uh since jim harbaugh is head coach we we really don't know what's going to happen here right because i feel like after after 10 years of tom telesco And then an assortment of different coaches, a complete variety, you know, just different characters from the ground up, you know, went through the entire cast, you know, and um, it's almost it's it's really interesting going into this draft because you don't really know what's going to happen. You don't know what type of player they're going to want. It's different now. There's no uh, let's go find the Johnny Wilson. You know, let's go find the biggest receiver we can find. And I bet you they have their their crosshairs right on him. Uh, it's different this year, and so I'm really excited to to get into this draft and see like what their what their philosophy is moving forward and what they're going to bring into the drafts and over the next ten years. Yeah, so this is going to be nothing but obviously a draft roundtable powwow discussion Q and A, whatever we want to call it. So obviously, guys, we're going to try to answer as many of your questions as we can throughout this next hour, hour and 15 minutes. So make sure to get everything in there. On top of that, Jason and I are going to just talk about, in general, some of the biggest storylines that we have that are leading up to April 25th. Um, Jason, again, I think we're in this position now where it's, what do the Chargers do at five? And you have your, it's now kind of been split up into three groups because there's your wide receiver group where it's your Marvin Harrison, your Malik Neighbors, your Roma Dunze, what do you do? There's your trade down group, which again, Makes perfect sense from the standpoint of this front office, what J- Joe Ortiz likes to do. You possibly make a trade back to, if it's 11 or wherever it is, possibly even a double trade down scenario, acquire more draft capital. You're taking the risk of losing out on three of the top wide receivers in this class if you do that, but still, you can find wide receiver talent in this draft. It is deep enough. Or there are those that believe <laughs> that the Chargers are going to follow the Jim Harbaugh blueprint no pun intended and strengthen the trenches and the take alternate an offensive, yes and, and, and take an offensive tackle at five and we've seen this from plenty of the mainstream outlets and just thinking that that is what Jim Harbaugh and this Chargers team is going to do and you know it, it it makes sense from the standpoint of what they want to install with this running game and that type of offensive system with Greg Roman moving forward and so now we're kind of in this, you know, three different group scenario as far as where people land of what they want the Chargers to do. In general, I know I know where I know you're kind of in the middle and I'm kind of in the middle in between the trading down wide receiver group. What do you just what do you take away from this in in general? I mean is is the offensive tackle at 5 I understand the the idea because of who's still on the board at that point in time. I don't think that there's a lot of people when you start breaking it down from a big board, uh, best player available type of perspective that anybody would have an offensive tackle above any of Malik Neighbors or Marvin Harrison Jr. I don't think that I think that there is a consensus that that would not be the case. But in this given circumstance, is necessarily taking an offensive tackle with your first pick? Let's just say for this case five is it is it a terrible move because i know that there still are people that believe that 
And again, it, this is mo- I think this is more people following the tea leaves and betting on what Jim Harbaugh is going to do, given his previous philosophy, than anything else. I still don't believe it. You look at ESPN prediction, it's a 66% chance, whether it's Marvin Harrison Jr., Malik Neighbors, or even Roma Dunze, that the Chargers are going to select a wide receiver at five. But then you have Bucky Brooks coming on the Believe In podcast and say, if I had to bet my money, Jim Harbaugh is going to select an offensive tackle at five. So where do you kind of weed that out? Do you think that this may just be a complete, you know, we are in the midst of draft season. Is this just another smoke and mirrors type of thing where it's, I'm going to tell you everything that I think that you are, that that you believe that I'm going to do over here. And then here's the shiny object over here. And and I'm going to surprise everybody. Would it have, would it have to be smoke and mirrors? I mean, I feel like those, so it, this really all depends on New England as well. Um, New England can shake up this entire draft. Like if, if Marvin Harrison Jr. is there and they still go Joe Alt, that would be whatever. Well, we, we won't get into the, we won't get into that. It hasn't happened yet. I'm not going to be angry about it yet. Um, I think for me, where I have that debate of offensive tackle at five. Why, if if that's really the route you're going to go, why would trading down not be your, why would it not be your primary decision there? The the thing you're really going for. Agreed. Um, Now let's say the Cardinals beat the Chargers to it and they trade down with Minnesota. Minnesota comes up and takes McCarthy. And let's just say Marvin Harrison Jr. is on the board. That's, are you still going to take, you know, Joe Alt with Marvin Harrison Jr. on the board? Well, you throw another scenario out there. What if New England takes Marvin Harrison Jr. and Vikings come up and take Drake May, Drake May at four? You know, then you're talking how far down are you willing to trade for a team that wants to come up for, for McCarthy? Would a team even do that? Well, now you're stuck at five. So once you're stuck at five and you're thinking Joe Alt here, right? I have this, I have this thing in my mind where, Okay, so trade back is off the table. Let's just say there's there's no team willing to move up that far for JJ McCarthy, and you're you're stuck at five. And Harbaugh's number one choice is Joe Alt in that situation. I have a hard time believing that, and maybe this is just me. I like Joe Alt, but you look at needs across the roster, right? And I think corner, and I think interior D line. And I think wide receiver, and you could keep going for needs. Oh, it's like all that DB in general, yes. like safety, corner, linebacker. They probably need another edge because you know Bosa and Mac at this point. You look at those contracts. That's that's not going to last much longer. Um, and so I, I look at all this and I think, can you really, can you really pass up on you know your Quinion Mitchell, your Byron Murphy, your Malik Neighbors? and take Joe Alt at a position where you would say it's like, it's not a pressing need right now. Is it, would you like to have a better right tackle? 100%. I think most teams in the league would choose to have five great starting down linemen, right? But you really dive into like what the needs are and what superstars you could get for those particular needs. Like you go and get Quinion Mitchell. I would say getting a Quinion Mitchell or Byron Murphy year one would have way more of an impact than going and getting Joe Alt. Would he be better than Trey Pipkins? Absolutely. I, I think I, I don't think there's a doubt in my mind about that. But would it? How how far does that move the needle with your number one pick at round at, at pick five? I agree. I agree. Uh, let's answer some of the questions that are coming in here. Um, one interesting one. It's, it's funny. Jason and I were just talking about, you know, it's so it's so crazy how much the draft boards change in between, you know, December, January. And then by the time that we get to this part of the draft and I was one of the ones several weeks ago, months ago, that was talking about the option of Brock Bowers for the Chargers being selected. Where did that go? <laughs> Where did that well, go? Free agency happened. The draft perspective boards changed dramatically. And look, 
I still love Brock Bowers. I think that mm-hmm. as an as an offensive weapon, what he's going to bring uh, to any team that he is selected by is going to be phenomenal. Now, obviously, things have changed dramatically with the Chargers roster, with Keenan Allen and Mike Williams no longer being there, and with the Chargers going out and getting two tight ends of free agency than Hayden Hurst and Will Disley. I think the Brock Bowers option is off the table, even if it is in a trade down scenario right now, because as Jason was just talking about the needs for this team and, and trust me, there will be scenarios where the chargers are going to go BPA, but you look at how the board is going to fall in terms of what the chargers need for wide receiver cornerback. If it's a trade down to 11, that's still in a prime position. You, if you get that extra draft capital, let's just say with a hypothetical trade with Minnesota and you get that extra pick at 23, that's a great option to have in terms of just tackles in general. It's still a pretty deep da- draft class as it relates to the tackles in this class. But I would still say center is a much more pressing need. Even though you brought in Bradley yeah. Bozeman on a one-year deal, I still think you need to find that linchpin for Justin Herbert for the next several years that you need to find. And this center class is very, very good um, when you start breaking the film down. I love what I see from this center class. Um, here's another one. In a different universe, and I tweeted about this earlier this week, I would love to see Latu on this team. There's nothing that's going to convince me otherwise. It's just he's one of my favorite players in this entire draft. If we traded back to 11, would the Chargers still take him? I, I I can't see that happening, unfortunately. As much as I would love to see it, because if this was a scenario where Joey Bosa or Khalil Mack did not end up returning to the Chargers, this would be a much more prominent conversation in my opinion, because if you were to get your future edge duo of Thule and in this particular case, Latu, that would just be so fun to watch be because healthy, I, Oh my God. They, they I think would, about it. That that would just be them as a duo would be fantastic to watch. Uh, I just think because their skill sets are so similar, what they did in their final year of college, the numbers were so similar. Their Setting the edge wouldn't be an issue. Exactly. Their intangibles are very similar. So I think that there would just be so much that they would feed off of one another. And the amount of pressure that you could be getting in a hypothetical defense like that would just be phenomenal. I would love to see that. Um, Kevin, why'd you... <laughs> We're going to ignore that comment. <laughs> <laughs> Again, didn't I come to you? Didn't I say this about like two months ago? I was like, why hey, does you this know, keep happening? Hey, you know, everybody's got a doppelganger. You know, it, it happens every, every every now and again. So don't let it uh, don't let it get to you. Uh, Back to Jason, Latu. At, yeah, so I was going to say, give me I, 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 I want to touch up on it a little bit. I, I remember texting um, back in December after watching a couple Latu games. And I was like, is is this guy an option in the top 10 for the Chargers? I think the Chargers were at pick like eight at the time or something like that. I was like, is that a, is that an option at eight? You know, Leatu Latu? Because, you know, you watch his tape. And I know a lot of people had questions about his athleticism. I, I really don't after his, uh, was it his pro day or his combine that he, that he scored pretty well. And I think it was his pro day. Um, but I don't really have questions about the athleticism, but in terms of hand usage, I don't think I've watched an edge over the last two to three years who has better hand usage than Latu. Um, more powerful hands. The second it hits the offensive tackle, it's it's a game changer. And I don't I don't think any edge in this class had the level of game breaking well games that Latu had. There were there were just moments where Latu would completely change the energy of the game, and you just saw the UCLA defense just blow up, right? And so with Latu Latu, I think I is there a world where that happens? If the Chargers trade back to eleven, I don't think so, just because of how things played off. Like we just talked about, how offensive tackle isn't really a need. Like, would you like to have one? Yes. Would you like to have Latu? I would. I would love to have Latu, but are you passing up on pairing Byron Murphy with Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack? Are you passing on that? Because you still got a gaping hole in the middle of that defensive line that you need to fill. Yeah. And see, Johnny Newton mentioned as well. Like, there are guys that you draft them in round one and they can play right now and have that impact. I love Latu. I think. 
I think he's a top five raw player in this class. Like if you're just looking at how good they are at playing their position, I think Latu is top five. I absolutely love Latu's game. But does it make sense with three edge rushers in front of him right out of the gate? I don't Probably know. Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Let's stay on the defensive side of the ball because we were just mentioning corners just a couple of minutes ago. In this particular question, what are the chances that the Chargers draft a top defensive player using their first two picks? Depends on the position, I guess. In this particular scenario, this to me sounds a lot like Chargers trade down to 11. And if it was me, now you start the conversation of Terion Arnold, Quinion Mitchell. I would love Quinion Mitchell early. Again, it, this would be this would be obviously taking into account that the top three wide receivers are most likely off the board by the time that the Chargers select at eleven. Most people have said if they if the Chargers end up doing this, that then because they've picked up extra draft capital, that they will go ahead and take an offensive tackle, whichever one still is on the board at eleven. If, in this particular scenario, I still would kind of push back on that. I still would kind I of push back on that a little bit because you then are going to tell me that. And not to say it would be a bad pick, because again, the the offensive tackles that you still could hypothetically have there on the board at eleven would be phenomenal. And in there's in this particular class, you have so many hybrids that you could essentially start whichever tackle it is that you would take at eleven at kick him in at guard, figure out the Trey Pipkins thing at a later date. But he could this player could essentially be your right tackle of the future. You just move the line around in a different way, but you still strengthen it. But in this particular case, let's just say three or four offensive linemen are off the board by the time the Chargers t get to number 11 and you say, do I take OL5 or do I take CB1? To I, me, think the question is CB1. Even, I, I think the question is even if you take, oh, well, oh, like tackle three, right? Because where is Quinion Mitchell for corners in comparison to Fuaga? for O-line, right? Would, would you say that Fawaga is as good of a tackle as Quinion Mitchell is as good of a corner? And would you say that offensive line is a more pressing need than that corner spot right now? For me, Quinion Mitchell is a phenomenal player. I love Quinion Mitchell. I love Terry on Arnold. Those guys are, are terrific corners. And you're really talking about you're getting into that next tier of O-linemen. You're getting into that that B, that like you have your alt and you have your Shanu and then you kind of go into the next tier, right? Versus tier one corner. So are you going tier one corner or are you going to tier two offensive line? What are you really doing there? Um, and that's why I push back against that is like, Oh, well they could trade back to 11 and get their, get their Fuwaga or their Fatanu out of Washington. Man, I really love the idea of going back to 11 and going and getting uh, Quinion Mitchell or Byron Murphy and really beefing up that defense in spots that it really would make an impact and maybe give Jesse Minter that one piece he needs, that one star he needs in the middle there, um, or even on the boundary that they really desperately need to um, to really shape that defense. Because I, I don't know if I could go another season with watching Derwin James just move all over the place because they have nobody to go there and just – overwhelmed with all these responsibilities and you talk about best player available i just i you can't sell me that at 11 you're getting into fuaga as the best player available you, you can't do it like there's i'm sorry there's no way with you know quinion or arnold or byron murphy there's no way you could sell me on that um so that's kind of like this this sacrifice you have to make there with Okay, so we're not going to take BPA. We're going to take how we want to build the team, which is OT four or five, like as you mentioned, instead of CB one or two. Yeah, uh, I'll answer this question in its complete fashion, obviously, because he was asking with their first two picks, is it possible that the Chargers take a top defensive player using that? The strongest possibility, in my opinion, and I've, I've been saying this for months now, and I've had discussions with Dan about this. I cannot see a way that the Chargers come out of the first two days of the draft without selecting a cornerback. They can't. They can't. Since they selecting cannot. Asante Samuel Jr., the highest priority that this, this, this team had put on a starting cornerback was Jason Verrett. 
And that has been way too long that this cornerback class has been valued that high with the talent that has come out of the draft. So in this particular class, because it's there's plenty of corners and pick your poison, whether or not we're looking for outsider in the slot, because you still don't know what Jasir Taylor is going to turn into as of right now. But Mike Sanders still just sounds like the perfect fit if he is there at 37, just from the standpoint of obviously the familiarity with Michigan uh, plays that is going to play that Jesse Minter defense to a T exactly what they need. He is hybrid enough to where you can, you know, move him inside or outside, whatever it is that you want to do. Um, so that's been a popular pick that a lot of people have been selecting there at 37. Obviously, San Ristol's stock has been rising a lot since the combine. Um, other options you possibly look at, I mean, Max Melton's <laughs> draft stock has been skyrocketing. There I can only options. assume that's what Mad Max means. I mean, <laughs> look, Alex there, there has been mock drafts that I have seen that have Max Melton selected in the back end of round one. I personally think that if the Chargers ended up pulling the trigger with the pick 37 some might consider that a little bit rich but again you need that physical presence at corner in this particular particular draft i don't think it's a big stretch and some people might think it is but i just you you turn on the tape of him and you're just like this max melton would fit in this defense for what it needs what it's lacked for several years under different defensive coordinators and too much of zone coverage you're going to need to you you're going to want Max Melton is going to bring some physicality to this defense. There's no doubt about that. I have. So corner is really interesting to me this year because when we, when we were talking corners back in December, it was very much a conversation of, is this corner class even good at all? Like that conversation was, was huge is where do you take corner? Because it doesn't look good. And we were talking about Quinion Mitchell in early round three, late round two. And I always had a little bit of pushback on that because I was really high on Kool-Aid McKinstry. I liked Terry on Arnold. Uh, I really liked those two players uh, watching Alabama. So I didn't, I, I had some pushback against it, but I definitely was there for the conversation of, I didn't know what there really was after that. And it's really interesting how corner worked this off season in terms of like, they took the corners and they kind of condensed them into a group, this tier, and then they all moved up. They all moved up. So all those corners that we were talking about, like round four, round five, round three, you know, the Max Melton, the Mike Sainra still, they condensed all these corners into like these three tiers and then all three tiers moved to the front of the draft. And so now you're talking about like, there's, there's probably six corners that have first round grades that you can go through. And then you have that next tier of Sainra still and Melton and Rakestraw and Lassiter. And they're all at the top of the second now. And you're really, you, we've really moved into this, this world. And this goes back to the conversation we were having about how much the draft has changed, where all these cornerbacks are front loaded right now. And it's turned out where I'm looking at, I'm like, this is a really great corner class. It and is. I don't know where it came from. And so in round two at 37, you know, you have so many guys. And I, the reason I push back on, on Max Melton being rich is because. Those two guys that you usually see around that 37 range, or three guys really, is TJ Tampa, Rake Straw Jr. out of Missouri, and Kamari Lassiter out of Georgia. And all three of those guys have a really big downside to their game. I would say for Rake Straw and for Lassiter, it's athleticism, just general athleticism, and what you're getting in man coverage how much man coverage potential are you getting out of them? Cause they really seem like zone run defenders to me that that Seattle cover three uh, archetype that we got used to for, for a few years there. Whereas Max Melton, you get a really balanced corner. You're getting somebody who can kind of go into a defense and be what you need him to be. Regardless, do you need him to be a slot corner? He can do it. Um, and he can do it with size and run defense as well. And he brings that man coverage potential. And so I don't, I, I push back against it being rich because I think he can do more than the other corners that we usually talk at 37 can. Like TJ Tampa, he's not a good tackler at all. Uh, Kamari Lasseter, the lack of athleticism is a big question after after his numbers that he recorded. And Rake Straw Jr., you really have a lot of questions of, uh, about him in that man coverage role. And so, Max Melton to me, 37 is, is a real possibility. And it just, it, it's a, it goes back to the other conversation we had about, you can't, 
you can't leave round two without taking the corner. You you almost can't unless you're going to take like a Javon Bullard who you can bring up into the slot, you know, who played a lot of slot in 2022 and played a little more deep in 2023, but, you know, gives you versatility in that DB room in general. Unless you're talking about that, having that conversation, I can get that. But I think they need a boundary corner really bad before they even touch up on slot corner and, you know, versatile DB. And I think Max Melton is a legitimate option there. Jason, you wanted to talk about this because I know, obviously, from what we opened up the show with, now everything talking about what are the Chargers going to do at five, possible trade down scenarios, wide receiver against offensive tackle. Now, obviously, talking about the cornerback position. You wanted to bring it up as far as, okay, let's get the big storyline picks out of the way. Let's move a little bit deeper into this draft. In terms of talking about what are some of the positions that the Chargers will we assume that they're going to address, but maybe aren't being talked about enough as it stands right now. So whether we're talking about the running back position, whether we're talking about the linebackers, whether we're talking about the centers in this class, um, in general, let's talk about a few of those. Where do you want to start? Oh, man. I, I Linebacker is really interesting to me. So I feel like at linebacker, what you have is you have maybe one per round for the first day or two where you have, you know, maybe you take Pey Peyton Wilson at the, at the, you know, 30 to 32 range. And then maybe you take Cooper at some point, late round two, early round three. And then you have junior Colson kind of that same range. Maybe you switch them depending on what you like with your linebacker. And then it, there's really this big gap where I don't know if I would take a linebacker after those couple of guys until five, six, seven in, in terms of like round five, six or seven. And so linebacker to me is really interesting because do you address it? This Peyton Wilson there at 37. Do you address it then? Because you're not going to get that caliber of linebacker in this draft again, not even close. I, I like junior Colson quite a bit, but the upside that Peyton Wilson gives you is, is so high. And so you talk about a position that maybe needs to be addressed almost as much as any other position out there because linebacker, what do they have right now? They have Denzel Perryman, Deion Henley, and um, Neiman? Is Dye. Neiman still on the roster? Not Neiman's still on the roster, yes. And you have Die. So that's four that you currently so, have on the roster right now. So where so is two it special value? teamers and two linebackers is really what you got. Linebacker is really interesting to me because I feel like you're going to have to wait until – you know, sixth or seventh round to really address that. Cause I don't know if you, with the amount of needs and I have the same argument for running back with the amount of needs you have, what round do you take a running back or a linebacker and push all those needs back? Yep. Like what round do you do that? I've seen some argue quorum in the third round. I, I, I can't, you know, it's like, regardless of, even if I thought quorum was this running back one, some people have that opinion. I don't, um, even if I, if I thought Matt Corum was that, where are you taking a, a running back or a linebacker to push all the other needs back? And that's why linebacker intrigues me so much is because you go in and you watch a Nathaniel Watson out of Mississippi state or a Jordan McGee, and you have, that's really where your conversation starts. And then you're getting into UDFA territory and so that one's going to be tough. That one is going to be really tough. And that's why I kind of wanted to touch up on linebacker first there is because I, even if Peyton Wilson is there, I, I can't take him. You know, we just talked about how you can't pass up 37 without taking a corner. If you didn't take one round one, and now you're going to take a, a linebacker and push that need back again. I don't, I don't think you can, I don't think you have that luxury right now. And so you start to talk about these late round guys that Nathaniel Watson, that Jordan McGee, and you find, okay, well, where are the guys with the tools that can offer me something late? Um, running back, I think, is the exact same thing. You mentioned running back is another one of those positions where it's kind of like, you know, on the on the back burner. Edge, you can throw edge in there as well. Uh, they need, we just talked about this, they need an edge eventually because you don't know how long they can push that, that need back in terms of 2025, 2026. And... With running back and edge, it's almost the same thing of like, how can you really push some of these things back to take a running back or edge in round three or round four? 
Um, I like Marshawn Lloyd a lot from USC. I like Audric Estime from Notre Dame, even though he had that really bad 40 time at the combine. I'm not too worried about that. And I just don't know how far you can push another corner. Like you're probably thinking in that range, you're probably Elijah, Elijah Jones, I think his name is out of Boston college. Um, I'm a really big fan of his. I, I love the, the, the ball playing skills. I love the, um, I love his physicality at the line of scrimmage. I'm a big fan of Elijah Jones out of Boston college. You're not getting that guy that takes the football away. If you take a running back at round three, or if you take a linebacker at round three, you're, you're skipping out on that boundary corner. You desperately need, um, because they need, as far as I'm concerned, they need two corners right now. They have Asante Samuel Jr., and that's that's really the only NFL starting caliber corner they have right now. We don't know what Christian Fulton is going to look like. Are we going to get 2023 Christian Fulton? 2022 Christian Fulton was also not great. There, there's so many needs here that I don't know that you can afford to take those. But there's a world, and I mentioned this earlier, where you know you prioritize getting that corner in round one. You prioritize getting that interior D line around one. And then you can maybe afford with a trade back to take some of those players in the middle rounds there. So a conversation that's going to get real interesting as we as we get closer to as we get closer to draft day and see a little bit more what kind of picks the Chargers are looking at. I'm really interested if they make a trade down before draft day or if it happens when they're on the board. The conversation of linebacker and running back, yeah, I think is definitely intriguing. And it's and it stands from the stand from the perspective to say, okay, the Chargers went out and they said, so let's start with linebacker first. So they went out and they signed Denzel Perryman. You bring in Die for the special teams uh, aspect. And again, both of these are on one year deals. So you know that the Chargers are going to have to prioritize this at some point. In general, with this linebacker class, if, so if you start breaking it down to say, okay, well, what fits best in Jesse Minter's defense for someone that you're going to invest in that is hopefully going to be a long-term replacement that you're, you know, player that you're going to be able to pair with Dayon Henley moving forward. And to me, when you look at the best coverage linebackers, that window narrows dramatically for the linebackers in that. So you're looking at Edron Cooper, you're looking at Peyton Wilson, as you mentioned, Cedric Gray, uh, or Junior Colson. To me, those are your are top. You fan four of uh, Cedric Gray? I am a fan of Cedric Gray as it relates to obviously the production is there. But in terms of what he does in, in coverage, it fits what Jesse Minter wants to run in this defense. So I do have it's 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 very interesting when Dan and I went through the linebacker ranking because we tailored everything to from a best fit scenario. Obviously, this would be a lot different if we were just talking about the general linebacker group. But where do you prioritize that? And to me, every after everything you just said, I, I don't think that this this even gets an idea of it at least until maybe round three at most, just depending on who's going to be still left on the maybe. board at that point in time. Maybe, maybe that's even a stretch. The running back situation is interesting as well, because some people are out there saying that if, if Blake Corum was on the board at 37, is Jim Harbaugh going to do everything he can to get him, which I don't mm -hmm. believe that that scenario is going to happen at all. I think with what the Chargers did with bringing in Gus Edwards, they obviously had a meeting with J.K. Dobbins. We still don't know if anything is going to come to fruition with that. You have Isaiah Spiller that still, as of now, we have no idea what Isaiah Spiller is going to look like without with just the limited amount of snaps that he has gotten so far in the league. What this does, I think, is actually a very good thing for the Chargers because this running back class in general is kind of pick your own flavor. I mean, people have there's not really a consensus number one running back in this group. Everybody's got their different guy that they believe is the top running back in this class, which totally makes sense. And I get it. What, what's your flavor of running back? What do you like? Who, who's yours? As far as my number one guy in this class, I would say it's Jonathan Brooks, but I'm okay. a huge Jalen Wright fan as well. And like you said, Marshawn Lloyd, I think would thrive in this offense, but I think for the standpoint to say, okay, you've got Gus Edwards now. I think that they are totally going to be comfortable moving forward with a very Raven-esque backfield where it's running back by committee where, yeah, you have Gus Edwards as your pseudo RB1, but he's not going to be the only one that's toting the rock. 
And if you were to tell me in a situation like this, I obviously understand your perspectives on Blake Corum, but let's just say for the the aspect of to say, is Blake Corum going to tote the rock every single down in this offense? No, but is he going to be part of a group that's going to do that? I could see that benefiting a lot of people. I think Marshawn Wood would be great in this backfield with Gus Edwards. But now just in getting back to this discussion, where does that prioritize where the Chargers possibly address the running back scenario? I think it pushes it down, but in the best possible way, because at that point, if we're saying, okay, the Chargers are going to take another run running back on day three, that's fine because you don't have to find your RB one in this scenario. Now you can get a mixture of guys back there that can do a lot of different things and make what you will of it in that running back by committee style. But I think that that is, it's a great thing for the chargers in that circumstance, because I think that they can push that need for running back down to day three, and you could still find a very serviceable running back to come into the mix of this group like that, because I definitely think that's what they're going to install. Yeah. And I mean, you don't take a piece of the committee at 37. You don't do that. Um, If he's going to be a piece of a committee, you're not, you're not taking him until that day three. Now, if you're if you're taking the workhorse, and I think there's a couple in this class, then you can have the conversation. But again, what are you willing to sacrifice to take one at 37? And there's too many positions that you're that you're pushing on the back burner. Like you're talking about, say they take a receiver at five and they're not trading down, and they take running back at 37. You still need a corner. You still need another lineman you still need another receiver eventually you still need probably another safety uh, interior D line linebacker. You still need so much and you don't take a piece of the committee at 37 and put all all those on the back burner. I think the only there's, there's maybe two or three running backs. I would be, I mean, I would still not be happy about it, but I would understand why they took him at 37 and I'm not saying I would be happy about it at all. In fact, I would be quite the opposite. I would not be happy about it. But Jalen Wright, you can clearly see if they took him what their goal is there with him and Gus Edwards. Like you can see that. And so I would get it from a certain standpoint of, okay, well, they they just got Jalen Wright at 37. This is the kind of team they're going to build probably going to be a lot more movement in the offense trey benson i think trey benson is he reminds me a lot of jonathan taylor he he really does and for those of you that don't know trey benson is my is my number one running back in the draft that's that's my number one and so i but again even my running back one i can't look at all that look at all that that's back there that you still need and you're taking a running back at 30 so i can't do it I can't do it. Give me some of your, I, I, and I, I always like asking this question because every, there's so many different ways you can go and everybody in the chat, you can of course drop this as well as in terms of your guys' perspective on this. Some of the, like, you know, Dan, Dan's coined his phrase now, you know, the Dan's dudes, as far as Dan's what he, dudes, his, some of his favorite players in the draft, regardless of position, regardless of round, whatever it is that we're looking for, you know, just give us kind of a broad perspective here in terms of who are your guys? Cause I know I've got a handful of mine as well that obviously I've just been pounding the table for, um, which normally means if I'm pounding the table for them, the chargers aren't going to end up selecting. Them. <laughs> so, but Hey, who knows? Uh, but Jason, a couple of years, who are some of your guys that you are really going to bat for in this draft, regardless of position or round? Uh, so I already mentioned Trey Benson. That's that's a guy I think should should be talked about in the early second, late first. You watch too much of his – it's Blake. <laughs> no. I, I, I'm i laughing at, uh, at that. No. So Trey Benson – is uh is a guy I'm really excited about in terms of late late first early second. You you watch his breakaway plays and most of the time it's even after he reads the gap a little late and he still gets it because he he forces those t- missed tackles like it's like it's nothing. And t- 2022 even more so than 2023. You look at 2022 Trey Benson and you're like this dude is going in the top 15. 
de- like he he was really good in 2022 and 2023 he, I still saw it I still saw it it's just you know the line wasn't as good and you know the there were just little pieces here and there in terms of middle of the play that he would get that he would get tripped up or such he was still just as good in 2023 to me as he was in 2022 it's just the circumstances around those plays were a little different so I would say I would start off with Trey Benson as one of my guys um and I'll kind of take this by by round a little bit here by day uh day two one of my guys I've been pounding the table for for since December is Javon Bullard out of Georgia. Yeah, you're big on Javon Bullard. I am a big Javon Bullard guy. So Javon Bullard is, I talked about this a little bit earlier. I touched up on it. That guy you go and get, if you want a safety who can play in the nickel, can play in the dime, a guy who can play that robber role really well when he does play deep. Um, If you want to free up Derwin James and Alohi Gilman a little bit more, you go and get a guy like Javon Bullard and it still helps your DB room a lot. And with Bullard, what you're getting is that versatility that you almost need three safeties in today's NFL. You almost do. Uh, in fact, I would say in Jesse Minter's defense, you definitely do need three safeties. And at this point, they don't have the third safety behind James and Gilman. And you insert Bullard into that conversation. And I think you've got, I think you've got a, a DB room that can really turn it around in the next in the next year but you still have boundary corner right and that's why i mentioned elijah jones earlier you talk about another corner in like that early day three elijah jones who had a lot of playmaking ability a lot of ball skills in his in his last year at boston college five interceptions i believe last year and really athletic guy that you could bring into the cornerback room if you're if you've missed out over that period of time we talked about maybe they take running back early I would advise against it, but maybe they do, or they take a linebacker. Um, it really depends on what they prioritize early. And if that gets pushed back, you're talking about that Elijah Jones. And I already mentioned Nathaniel Watson earlier. That's another guy I would mention as, as one of my guys. And then I, I'd like to think my bread and butter is wide receiver. And that's where you really get into like the Malik Washington's and the Ryan floor noise out there and the Jacob Cowings. I'm a big fan of Jacob County. His tape is so good. I know the numbers aren't quite there, but it, his tape is so good. So a lot of guys I really like in this class and guys that are available to you from, from top to bottom. Yeah, I would say mine are some of the more prominent names, obviously with Zach Frazier. I just love Zach Frazier's game. And I'm, again, I'm very bullish on this center class Uh, as it stands. I still believe that if he didn't get injured, it would definitely be, you know, who's going to, who's going to be the first center off the board. And to me, it would have came down between JPJ and, uh, Zach Frazier in that conversation, and it would have been a lot closer than what it's basically projected as, as it stands right now. Braden Fisk is another one that I just absolutely love, and again, we're talking about priority for where Edge is going to ultimately be end up taking in this draft. And do you have Fisk it. as an edge? I know that he can. I know that he can come off the edge, but just, and he is more of that hybrid in terms of what he can do along the defensive lineman, and that's what I think that I like him. It's a little bit more in that. I guess in that Morgan Fox type of mold, if you will. And I just love what I see from his game, man. It's just the, the, the intensity that he plays with the nonstop motor that he comes off the snap with uh, and everything like that was obviously shown very well at the combine during his testing in terms of his athletic ability and what he's able to do. Um, But I think it just, in, in terms of just getting a guy who would just play like every every down like his hair is on fire that's something that i think that this team especially along the defensive line absolutely needs and fisk to me is one of those guys if we go in the cornerback department renardo green out of florida state is another one that i really like um you know great size and athleticism for him great in coverage great is in terms of what this defense is going to need i really like what i see from the tape of him um you know how I feel about Latu, obviously. <laughs> can't can't get out of that conversation without saying that he's one of my guys in this draft. Uh, he's good at football. Y- yes, <laughs> he could just make it as simple as that. He's good at football in that circumstance. Um, shift this over to the center conversation, because I know I brought up Zach Frazier there a minute ago. Bradley Bozeman, obviously, is a stopgap option, as it stands right now. One-year deal for that. 
I don't think that I've gotten a chance to have a conversation with you in general as far as what this center class is bringing. What do you see from it? Who do you like? Where do you think the Chargers ultimately end up prioritizing it? I feel like it's a little underrated. I feel like I feel like every time you get a guy like JPJ up there in the in like that mid to high first round range. And I don't know where his stock has gone. I've heard it's gone down. I've heard it's gone up. I don't know. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of guys here that you that you can like in different schemes. Like Zach Zinter is a guy where if you get him a little bit into a power scheme and let him get his hands on guys easier, um, he's absolutely a guy that can be a very serviceable center for, for a while if you get him into the right scheme, like a great Roman scheme. Uh, so so Zinter is one. And I know he, I believe, Zinter you're thinking, of, guard, you're thinking Zach, right? Zin, yeah, I was going to say, I think Zinter's slotted more as a guard in this class. Yeah, I, I, I like him. I like him as a center too. And I know I've, I've had some conversations where, where people think he can play center at the next level, but um, there's a lot of interior O-line options. And I know Harbaugh also mentioned, um, what do you say, McFadden? as a center option or was it uh Jordan McFadden as a possibility to slot in that center option? Was it McFadden? Yes. Okay. Okay. I wanted to make sure. Um, so I know, I know that's also an option. I think if you just add more to the interior offensive line, um, Drake Nugent is another option here. CJ Hansen. If you, if you just add more to the interior offensive line room and just kind of just take the good guys, man, just take good players. And it'll kind of sort itself out. If if you get if you get what I'm saying there, if in terms of don't focus too much on zoning in on this one thing they need, right? In terms of center, because there there's options that play guard that can play center. But you know, Hunter Nor I don't know how to say his name, but I'm not Hunter, Nor Hunter Norzad. Hunter Norzad. Yes, Norzad. I really like him as well. And so the the class just goes so deep, and I don't really separate by center. I just separate by interior O line versus offensive tackle. And there is that you know some guards can't play center, but those names that I mentioned, I definitely all like for the center position. Zinter, I think, would actually translate to to center extremely well. And that's just my take on it. I think if you get him into more of a power run scheme and let him get hands on and move bodies. I think he would be a really strong center for, for a scheme like that. Yeah. To, again, uh, you know, Zach, for Zach Frazier in the, in the second round to me, it just it seemed would seem like a logical choice if the board ended up falling that way. I, I think don't it even was, know if he'll be there. Uh, it's, it's, it's possible. I know that there was talk again, and this is where, the draft conversations shift from month to month, but there was conversations at one point to say, Oh, is there a possibility that three centers could be taken in round one? And again, that, that conversation took place months ago. I think we're away from that. And especially with everybody talking about Graham Barton from Duke, you know, translating to that center position because he can basically play anywhere along the offensive line if he wanted to, but his size just sizes puts him well there at center. But Zach Frazier, I think, who was it? It was, um, uh, it was Field Yates that did his mock draft where he had the Chargers trading back to 11, taking, I believe it was J.C. Latham that he had him taking at 11, and then at 23, he had him taking A.D. Mitchell, and then at 37, he had him taking Zach Frazier. And I said, oh, you know, hey, that's not a bad way to start cooking in a draft. And I, I liked that way that it could possibly play out. And again, I still think that 37 – is a viable option for Zach Frazier at 37, depending on how the board is ultimately going to play out. Set it for him, parent out of Georgia. I really like his athleticism, obviously for how quickly he can get to the second level. When you start putting uh, some of those plays out there in, in the screen game, again, you talked about Hunter Norris out of Penn state in terms of overall fit. Greg Roman, I think, would love to have Hunter Norzat in this particular system. Drake Nugent, for what he did in Michigan, I think he's very intelligent at the center position. I think he is a, uh, a bulldozer when they need him to be, and he's a great pass protector when called upon. So I really like what I've seen from his game. Tanner Bordellini out of Washington, or I was about to say Washington, excuse me, of Men Wisconsin, is one of the most athletic centers in this class. Maybe he doesn't have some of the overall intangible grades that some of the other 
uh, centers in this class too. But Tanner Bordellini just absolutely blew up the combine. So his athletic skills are definitely there. In terms of when you address it, to me, I could see those conversations start happening in, as I mentioned, 37. If it doesn't happen at 37, does it possibly get stretched to day three? It's possible that you find a serviceable center on day three, especially if we're talking about the Chargers having two fourth round picks at the beginning of day three. So I could definitely see it being addressed yeah. in that window. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a that's an interesting conversation to have when you address it. Um, eleven? Did he he? You said Latham at eleven. That was yeah. That was Field Yates's mock draft. Uh, he had Latham at the Chargers trading back with Minnesota at 11. He had him taking JC Latham. Then at 23, he had him selecting AD Mitchell. And then at 37, he had him taking Zach Frazier. It's, it's not, two players it's are not, not bad. It's not bad. I, I actually really liked what I read off of that mock draft. I thought that was an interesting perspective and I like the, the way positions. I like what I like what he's going for there. It's just the players. Um Latham at 11 is bold. Uh, A.D. Mitchell at 23 is bold, too. Those, those are two bold picks. I love the Frazier at, at 37. Um, I'm not as high on A.D. Mitchell as I think everybody else is. I think I'm a little little lower on him. Not huge, a lot, I'm not saying I have him way down the board or anything like that. Um, it's just with A.D. AD Mitchell, I have, a, I have a little too many questions um, to – to go and select him and be the number one wide receiver. I think if they still had Keenan Allen, I would be, I would be open to that at, at, even at 23, because then you're talking about, um, then you're talking about, you can assume that risk a little bit, but with Quentin Johnston on the roster and going and talking about AD Mitchell at, at 23. And I, I have concerns about AD Mitchell in terms of some of the tape. I like the tape a lot. He's one of those interesting players where he has some tape where he just flashes and you're like, yeah, I can see it. Um, and then you look at the numbers and then you see some of the bad tape and you get some questions about, I don't want to say effort because I'd never like questioning somebody's effort like that. But in terms of like the in-between, like what happens in between those flash plays and I have some questions. Jason, I'll give you this question to you. Uh, Steve Simmons here. How do you, how do you guys feel about, I'm assuming he was mentioning Lad McConkey or Xavier Leggett? How do you feel about both of those guys? Leggett, you got to have some concerns for the late breakout. But if you put his 2023 tape in a vacuum and ignore the rest, I can see why he gets some of that hype to the Lions in the first round, for example. I can see, I can see why he goes in that range for some people. Uh, it's just the late breakout and some of the the fluidity in his routes in terms of those concerns. Lad McConkey, I've actually flirted with the concept of him being like the wide receiver four of this class. And, you know, him and Pearsall are really good receivers that I think kind of get unfairly labeled into this slot role. Like, oh, they're like a power slot guy. And it's like, they're good outside receivers and they're athletic dudes. And, for, for Lad McConkey, the reason I've, I've kind of flirted with that wide receiver four conversation with him is I don't know if there's a better – outside of like the, the top three, and you get into that conversation where he might be the best route runner in the class. Outside of like the Odunze, the Neighbors, the Harrison Jr., you really get in that conversation where McConkey might be the best route runner in the class, the best separator in the class. And then it moves into – well, he's also the one of the more athletic wide receivers in the class. And you put those two things together, and it's hard for me to it's hard for me to see him falling to even the second round. And there's just some fits I really like for him in the first round. And so like at 23, if you like if you get that pick, that's how I feel about McConkey. Like it's a conversation for me. This will be the conundrum I think that the Chargers are gonna be in sticking with this conversation on the wide receiver. If let's just say that what people are presuming or some people are presuming to pass is that the chargers went offensive tackle at five, again, hypothetical here. You think about how many wide receivers you're potentially going to pass up throughout the first round. 
you're going to start off the second round with Carolina with their first pick of the draft. Most likely that's going to be a wide receiver to get help for, for Bryce Young in that circumstance. If New England ends up taking a quarterback at three, which a lot of people expect them to do, they will most likely be taking another wide receiver at, with their pick as well before the Chargers are on the clock at 37. If you get into that type of scenario where, let's just say, if the Chargers did take a Joe Alt at five, how are you going to, how would anybody weigh that at that point in time? Because we've talked about the need for corner to get out of day two at that, in that scenario. Now you have, all these wide receivers that have now been taken off the board before you ultimately get to select at 37. I still think you can definitely pick one at 37. That's ultimately going to be productive for you. I'm not trying to knock the wide receiver class in that scenario, but these are the, these are the kind of the devil's advocate type of scenarios to say, whether it was whoever, whoever, whatever position group that you believe that you're higher on, these are the type of cause and effect moments that ultimately end up playing out for you along for the draft. So if the Chargers ultimately ended up sticking and picking at five and hypothetically selecting Joe Alt, I think the opportunities from a standpoint of their biggest need on the roster as it stands right now at wide receiver, not to say that they can't fill it, but the talent that you're ultimately going to pass up on by possibly doing that, that's a stretch. Yeah, you're talking... You like worst case scenario there is they could be picking like wide receiver nine at 37. Like they could be deciding between some guys that they didn't expect to be because the wide receiver class truly is that good. Um, and that brings another issue is like you take Joe Alt at, at five, and you miss out on a lot of those wide receivers. Let's say you let's say you have Let's let's find a good one here in terms of like that range at like we'll we'll say around like the 45 range. That way we can kind of simulate that um those wide receivers going off the board. And you're talking like a like a Troy Franklin, maybe. Uh, a Troy Franklin or a Corley, Malachi Corley. And that's where you can kind of talk about okay, here's our best receivers at 37. Maybe Keon Coleman is there. He he's been an interesting topic in terms of like how how high and low, like he's gone. Uh, it, it doesn't seem that long ago he was wide receiver four in this draft. And so now you're talking about maybe you take a Troy Franklin or a Malachi Corley in, at 37 or a Roman Wilson at 37. Let's say you do that, right? Let's say you go Joe Walt and then you go Roman Wilson because I know Roman Wilson is a, is a favorite of a lot of a lot of this fan base uh, for, for obvious connections to, to Jim Harbaugh in Michigan. And he's just a good receiver. He's a he's a good separator. Let's say you do that. You have now gone two rounds. You're going to be in the third round, and you haven't gotten an interior D line. You haven't gotten a corner. That's that's an issue. That's a big issue because now you have this situation where after. After that first wave of interior D linemen, you're getting into some guys with questions. Uh, one name that pops up to mind immediately is Mason Smith out of LSU, um, who is kind of like that opposite of your guy Fisk. Fiska? Fiska? Fisk? Fisk. Fisk. Oh, that's cool. Um, it's kind of that opposite problem where he has the measurables. He has the explosive. You ha you can see why he was this five star recruit, and you can see why he offers so much potential. But it's the opposite of Fisk, where the flashes on the flashes on tape aren't there. With with Fisk, it's there. The flashes on tape are there. It's just he doesn't have the measurables. With with Smith, it's 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 really the opposite, and it's really an issue once you get into this range for interior D line. Because it feels like every single player at that at that spot for interior D line has question marks, like big question marks, not little ones, like big question marks. Like why were they really not good in 2023? Because you getting you're getting into this conversation where uh, Makai Wingo, I think Makai Wingo is like six foot, isn't he? Like six foot exactly, and outplayed Mason Smith. Like, I know Mike, Makai Wingo is higher on some people's boards than, than Mason Smith. Despite Mason Smith, he should be this freak of nature. You look at his measurables. You look at 
how he how he plays in those in those brief flashes that he had in 2022 or 2021 i think it was 2021 i believe he was hurt in 2022 and you're like how is this guy you watch that 2021 tape those flashes on 2021 you're like how is this guy not better and then you watch 2023 it's like because he wasn't good at football and so that's that's where i get a little more concerned is you skipped out on these two positions that you really need because you wanted to go Joe Walt at five and then a wide receiver at 37. And now you're talking about you still need interior D line and you still need corner. Kyrie Jackson stock has been going way up. He might not even be there in the third round. You're talking about maybe you have to go in Elijah Jones. Like I mentioned earlier, maybe you have to address it at 37 instead like a corner or interior D lineman and wait for Javon Baker in the third round in terms of wide receiver. And so you skip out on wide receiver at five. I don't know how you can address it at 37 without having like some serious concerns on skipping corner again, on skipping interior D line. I think you have to wait for wide receiver again. I think you'd have to keep waiting because at that point you're, you're really digging yourself a hole. Yeah. The other side of that coin is, if you got to that point, you selected an offensive tackle, and now now you're talking like positions aside. 37's actually been a popular conversation for the Chargers to say, okay, if they stayed put, and let's just say if they took Marvin Harrison Jr. at five. 37's become a popular topic to say, okay, well, the Chargers could possibly just, they would trade down in that scenario and get some extra draft capital. Imagine if you did this, if you ended up taking Joe Alt at five. And then you ended up trading down. And then to push that needle back to say, okay, well, yes, you you gained more draft capital. But now you're going to have to wait just a little bit longer if you're going to end up taking your wide receiver or your corner or whoever else that you end up making that overall second selection with. So again, offensive tackle in terms of that conversation, it's not. It's I'm, I'm not poo-pooing that as an as a possibility for the Chargers to do in the first round. But in terms of the difference of selecting it at five as opposed to selecting it at eleven and getting more draft capital still, again, seems like the more logical choice. Uh, Jason and I are going to be on here for another eight minutes or so. So anybody that wants to fire off uh, some questions here before we get off, go ahead and just uh, uh, go ahead and send them into the chat. Appreciate that. Um, I think in, in general, as we're getting closer in here again, 11 days to go until the NFL draft. Uh, so much buzz and intrigue as for what the Chargers are going to end up doing. Do you see any possibility of like a surprise scenario, Jason, like a total curveball, like to say, okay, let's just say in the first three picks, I know we've all been talking about, it's like, okay, they got to do a wide receiver. They got to do a corner and put in, you know, another X position. Do you think that there's going to be an out of left field type of scenario to say, oh, well, the Chargers addressed that position. We didn't see that one coming <laughs> at, at that particular spot. I I mentioned this I've mentioned this a few times. Corner at five, I feel like would be would be oh, the curveball thrown oh. that would that would freak a lot of people out. That's a bold choice. It would freak me out. <laughs> but I, I think it's I think it's entirely possible just because of the state of the room and the talent of the guys that are there. That Quinion Mitchell. Um who was it that mocked was it Daniel Jeremiah? that mocked Arnold to five or said Arnold could go five. Again, here's the, here's the difference between Daniel Jeremiah's mock point one, you know, 1 1.0 to 3.0. Right. Yes. That was, that was a scenario that was played out. Many yeah. And then ago, it shifted. Like. Yeah. It shifted from there to, Hey, it's going quarterback, 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 receiver, receiver, and maybe receiver again. And so I feel like that curveball could be, I mean, there's so many options that could go as a curveball. Um, Man, Byron Murphy could go a lot sooner than we think. I think there's a real chance he goes in like that top eight range. Um, whereas you know before Byron Murphy was often talked about in that like second or third round. But I would say I would say Quinion Mitchell at five would probably be my curveball. <sighs> where like I could I could see it happening. That's not just a curveball. That's like multiverse eight three yeah. eight scenario. <laughs> that's like that's yeah, an ultimate that's... scenario right there. Wow. Uh, if it was me, I would say, and this and this would probably be in a trade down scenario, but I I could see a 
I would, maybe this is me talking with my heart more than my head realistically, but if hell, if you wanted a really curveball scenario, Chargers select an edge in the first round and they go that direction. Ooh, I, ooh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a, again, that's me speaking more from here just because if there's one particular player that I would love to see don the powder blues, of course, but that would be my ultimate curveball scenario. Uh, Jason, let's answer a few of these questions that we've got here in the chat. What are the possibilities they actually trade down considering that the likely options for them to trade down would be the Vikings, the Raiders and the Broncos right off the bat. I'm going to say it's, it's very unlikely that the Chargers ultimately end up doing a trade with either the Raiders or the Broncos. If this was for any other player that they were coming up for that was not a quarterback, I would say that the Chargers could likely do a trade down scenario in this case. But now you're talking about, let's just say quarterbacks go one, two, three, four. So now JJ McCarthy is the final quarterback that's left on the board at five. Do you want to let your division rivals have that player? And in my opinion, I wouldn't. You don't know. You don't give your division rivals a shot at their quarterback in the future. You don't do it at a franchise quarterback. Could you imagine trading down to the Broncos and giving them McCarthy? And then McCarthy ends up being this like superstar quarterback. Even if you're not confident in your, even if you're confident in your analysis and think like, oh, JJ McCarthy, but I mean, your head coach thinks JJ, thinks JJ McCarthy is the number one quarterback. You probably don't give the number one quarterback in your head coach's eyes to Denver. You probably don't do that. And so, I would say no way. I would say if you're looking for options, um, Minnesota at 11, yes. Um, Chicago at nine. Nine, right? That's where they pick? That's where they pick, ag- pick again. It, it, okay, so Chicago, yeah, Chicago wants at to nine. jump back up, yes. Um, I could see Chicago moving up for a Neighbors or a Dunze. I could see it. Uh, if, you're, if you're comfortable with trading down a little further, Indy at 15, who reportedly has serious interest in Malik Neighbors. That's another option you could go in terms of trading down, but I don't know. I, I I could see it happening just because of the amount of needs and the stress they've put on how much they want to accumulate more picks. And I would I would like it because, as I've mentioned multiple times, Quinion Mitchell is one of my favorite players in this draft. I think he's an extremely talented player. I think he might be the best defensive player in this draft, maybe. Um, if not, he's up there. I would I would consider you know trading down a little bit maybe the nine with the Bears and uh, getting yourself a Quinion Mitchell I would love that Can I see it We'll see Do you guys consider twenty twenty five picks in a trade down My thought is the team isn't going to win a Super Bowl this year So why not load up on picks for multiple years Yeah I think this is absolutely in the conversation especially specifically with Minnesota because of the lack of capital that they currently have in this particular draft outside of the first round, yes, you're going to be addressing that. People have said that they wouldn't take a third round in 2025 as part of that trade package. They would need it to be a little bit more rich. They would want essentially Minnesota's first round pick in 2025 as well on top of 11 and 23 this this coming draft, which probably if you if the Chargers ended up doing that, there would be a lot of people I would think that'd be saying fleece in, in that scenario. Because if you look at the draft metrics as far as how the value board works, the Chargers would definitely be getting more if they ended up playing that out. In general, do the Chargers consider 2025 picks in a trade down, whether it's at five, whether it's at 37 or any point in this draft? Absolutely. I definitely I think, think so. that. I, I think Joe Hortiz is definitely thinking long game here in terms of how he wants to build. He's spent 26 years in Baltimore doing it that way. So no, I don't, I don't think that 20, 25 picks are off the table in any of these trade down scenarios. Uh, let's look at a few other questions here. Before we get out of here, uh, searching, 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 searching. Please, please don't trade with the Broncos or the Raiders. Yeah, absolutely. You know, specifically as it relates to that quarterback scenario. Yes. I don't think Denver would give us Patrick Sertain this second. Uh, no, I, don't I, think that would I saw that hypothetical trade uh, earlier this week that was posted. I don't think that that happens at all. Um, in a trade back scenario, how likely is Roman Wilson in the second? I think Roman Wilson in general, trade back scenario or not, is a very likely option for the Chargers. Again, you look at the overall fit, what he would want, what he would bring to this offense in terms of he wants to do. You've heard him even say the whole no block, no rock quote. He knows exactly what he would need to do in this offense with Greg Roman. And for everything that we have seen thus far with Jim Harbaugh and Greg Roman in terms of 
the pieces that they've been putting out there in terms of the offense that we believe that they're going to want to run. One thing we know for sure is Jim Harbaugh wants to revitalize this offensive line in this running game. And Roman Wilson, in terms of what he can do, not only as a pass catcher, but what he could do as a blocker, would fit into this uh, system just like a glove. I, I, I would not mind seeing Roman Wilson uh, donning a Chargers jersey at any point in this draft, at, in any scenario. Yeah, I went into Roman Wilson's tape expecting like a vertical threat and like a, a speedster. I was really impressed with the separation I saw uh, from his tape. He's a, he's a really awesome option in the second round. I think that should absolutely be on the table. Spoiler alert on this, we're not going to do a mock draft today, but as we get closer to the draft, we will be doing a mock draft, and I assure you it will it'll be chaos <laughs> as, as we get into this, like most mock drafts are, because as soon as you hit complete, uh, virtually everybody hates it, and all of your picks were wrong, and <laughs> that's just how it ends up playing out. With I want to do one really bad. But, the, you know, that's the beauty of mock drafts, man. That's the beauty of them, because there's just so many different scenarios that you can play out, and... You're going to get criticism one way or another when you end up completing a mock draft. Just that's just how it goes. But uh, believe me, we will be doing mock drafts. Um, our big one, like we normally do, and that we've done in years past, usually happens the week of the draft. So look out for that between Monday and Wednesday of next week. That we'll ultimately be doing that mock draft. Uh, looking forward to it. So we're going to go ahead and wrap up for today. But definitely was looking forward to this live conversation again. 11 days until the 2024 NFL draft. Jason, thank you so much for coming on. Really appreciate getting a chance to talk some draft powwow with you. Always good to get another uh, perspective in here and talk about it because I definitely know that in terms of the spectrum, you've got your differences as it relates to draft prospects, but hey, there are some good ones. And so I really enjoyed chalk, talking chalk with you and we'll look forward to having you on here in the next 11 days leading up to the draft. Thanks again uh, so much to everybody for tuning in. Chargers Unleashed, Jason Ballier, Jake Hefner here from Chargers Unleashed. We will see you next time on Chargers Unleashed.